not a historian at all. I'm not an archaeologist, which is completely different. Um, but I pretend to be a historian from time to time. And as Brandon said, uh, besides working um, in archaeology, I work in the commercial sector. I work for a company called Rubicon Heritage. Uh, we're based on Cork. But on the side, I've been involved in this project for the last God, maybe four years or so. Um, and the project is it's about to see the schoolhouses in Ireland. Um, I began in about 2014, um, kind of started by accident, took a few photographs of schoolhouses, came across <coughs> other ones, and um, I started to put them onto a blog online, and um, they generated a bit of interest. I kept doing it for a couple of years, and it's kind of developed actually into a book that's coming out in September. Um, and basically, that's, that's the origin of what I started to do. But when I began, I was really just, it was mostly just photography based and looking at the, arch the architecture really of the schoolhouses. <clears throat> I hadn't given much thought really to their, their meaning or their social significance or what, what they actually mean in the landscape or why they're there or how they became to be disused or why they're in specific locations, why they're down on the western side of the country, not so much on the east. We didn't really think much about who went there and um, what the places mean to them. But as I kind of continued, and I would be talking to people um, as I was traveling around the country, photographing these places, and it started to become clear that the important element of these buildings was probably not so much the bricks and mortar, although they have their own architectural merit uh, quite often, but it's actually the place itself and the significance it is for people and the importance in social memory and basically what they reflect about rural Ireland and how Ireland is changing now and has changed over the past decades, 50 years, 100 years or so, how the landscape has changed and how people live in rural Ireland. As you know, I'm sure if you're from rural Ireland yourself, <coughs> towns across the west of Ireland, in particular Cork, Kerry, up around the border regions, have had thriving market towns through the 18th to the 19th century into the 20th century, hopes of activity um, and predominantly a rural-based society in Ireland, 62% of the population until 1960 lived in rural Ireland, but it wasn't really um, an urban um, population. <coughs> but that's changing these days. I think we're down to about 40% or so live in rural Ireland, about 60% live in an urban setting, be that in big cities or larger towns. So the rural landscape is kind of emptying out um, and it's changing. So what these schools kind of represent and their position in the landscape and place that they are located, they kind of reflect the changing life wave of rural Ireland really. There are many other facets of rural Ireland, I'm sure you're all familiar with this if you listen to the radio or watch the television, you know about guard stations closing down, rural pubs closing down and people lamenting various different services disappearing. There's it's, you know, people can look at it in two different ways. One is that these services are, are disappearing, people are moving because the services are disappearing, but are the services disappearing because people aren't there? And it's kind of a feedback loop, really. And the schoolhouses are part of that as well. So that's kind of what they represent. Um, there's just some little details there. Twitter, if um, anybody involved in social media, I, I post all this stuff up on Twitter. It's a Twitter handle, and there's a Facebook account. Um, page as well where, where I put, put down the certain blog up. Okay, do. So this evening, uh, this afternoon today, it's only about two o'clock in the day. Um, why don't you have something better to do on a Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about what, what the project is about. Um, we'll do a little brief history of, of the schoolhouse in Ireland and education. Um, why there are so many abandoned schoolhouses scattered across the rural Irish landscape in particular. So you see this is very much a rural based phenomenon. Then we'll look at architectural meaning, what the architecture of these schoolhouses tell us about, the people who attended the schools, <coughs> but also the people who built the schools and how they were going to be used. Um, what it says about the society at the time and how they viewed people and viewed education. Uh, also what makes a building important. It is an important element that kind of came or as I went through the project, that these schoolhouses are protected quite often. Some are, some aren't, depending on their 
usually they're architectural matters that they're they're protected by the national uh, not in legislation but they're recorded at least in the national inventory of architecture and heritage occasionally these are schoolhouses are, are possibly have a more original design or more remarkable but a lot of these don't they haven't been recorded in the national inventory of architecture and heritage so they have no protection if they fall down if somebody bulldozes them there's no consequence and then we look a little bit about place, space, and memory. And that has to do with people who went to the schoolhouses and what they mean to them, and what kind of social significance, what kind of memories are tied up in these buildings. And does that in itself make a building important? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, yeah for sure. Okay. <coughs> uh, right, Joe. So, what is the project about? Well, as mentioned, um, it began by accident. It began just purely by me having nothing to do on a Saturday afternoon. And I started photographing schoolhouses, um, purely from an aesthetic and kind of architectural perspective. Um, but um, I then I began to research them at a local level, um, meet people who attended the schoolhouses, realized that um, the schoolhouse weren't just bricks and, bricks and mortar, they were important within local communities. They were a place that everybody had in common, that the people in the local community shared because they would have gone to school there. And they're places with a lot of memory and um, emotions attached to them. So it was important to record that too. So it was important to speak to the people who went to the schoolhouses, collect the folk memory about them. Um, and then I wanted to synthesize this research, so taking the the photographs and the vacant empty spaces and want to combine it with what people could remember about the place and kind of document what the empty spaces contained. Because they're not just empty spaces, they're, they're spaces full of memory, they're spaces full of meaning. And then presenting that online on the blog, which then encouraged people to come forward with even further <coughs> stories and kind of document what they had to say about the place. Uh, so that engagement with the online public kind of stimulated com conversation, stimulated research. So it was a way of kind of getting people involved, the public involved in historic, basically historical research without even realizing it. The stories they were bringing forward about the schoolhouses were stories that would be lost if, if they didn't they didn't realize that they probably contained, they, they held the historical information themselves. Um, so part of the, the historical research was using resources like the school's folklore um, collection. So are you familiar with the school's folklore yeah. collection? Yeah. Um, I'll just give you a quick idea of what it is, just in case anyone doesn't know. 1936 <coughs> through 738, um, the Folklore Commission um, basically handed out kind of a, a pro rata form to all the national schools in the country um, for the eldest child in the family to take home and they would go to the eldest person within the family and ask them to tell them the oldest stories that they knew about the locality. These are all written down by the school children themselves, uh, brought back to school and then banned and collected, um, and then stored centrally by the Folklore Commission. This is in the 1930s, bear in mind the oldest person in the, in living in the house, probably 70 or 80 years old or even older at the time. So what they were in effect doing was collecting first-hand primary source information that would date to the mid 19th century. So it's a huge resource. This is all collected in 1937 in each of the national schools, many of the ones that I photographed. And I could combine the photographs with these documentary records. So you could actually match the buildings up with school children that attended these schools in the 1930s and bring it back the basically tie space to, um, to the written documents. Um, that was one of the, the more important um, primary sources that I used. Um, so that's all kind of part of what the project involved. It involved kind of tying um, the folk memory with the building, with the, with the physical building itself. I just have some photographs here. Um, so when it comes to photographing and documenting the schoolhouses, these are the kinds of places that I was interested in. A lot of people would get in touch <clears throat> to 
and say, well, would you like to photograph this school or photograph that school? But quite often they were still in use. There may be old schools, maybe 19th um, century school houses, but I was particularly interested in ones that were collapsing and were in um, a state of disrepair, not ones that were still functioning, because the ones that were in disrepair were the ones that were under the greatest threat. We have one Latin National School, County Sligo, with a sheep making his way through the classroom here from the last people's <coughs> Drum Temple in Roscommon and Shana Bahara in Mayo. Do you know, do you know Shana yes, Bahara? Yeah. It's on the way to yeah, no. Nantes, no, that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a beautiful building inside, absolutely wonderful. But um, mm -hmm. how long more will it last? I'm not too sure. The roof, the roof is in the great, in the great state. Um, I don't know what, what plans they have for the building. But it's a good example of um, the building itself dates to 1935, but it, it, the decor of the building is actually a little bit older, it probably dates to the 19th century. And it's not protected in, in the National Inventory of Architecture Heritage, it's not recorded in the National Inventory of Architecture Heritage. It is no more remarkable on an architectural merit than any other building that isn't on it. Um, <clears throat> the same with Drummond Temple and the same with Boyle Island. These are not protected buildings. Though they do hold uh, incredible significance for the local community, so we we don't know what their fate will be. Somebody could decide, um, I'm going to buy that land, and they they're perfectly entitled and legally entitled to knock the building over. That's that's the way that it is. That's the way that it stands at the moment. I don't know if that's going to change. Um, and there's reasons why it should, and reasons why it should. And you can't protect everything. You can't make everything um, untouchable, but. You have to judge what a building is worth and why why it was worth something. Is there <coughs> is there value beyond its architectural merit? Is there value because it means a lot to the community? <coughs> so so to begin with, we'll look at like a, a little brief history of um, the education system in Ireland. The reason that we look at that is it goes partly towards explaining why there are such a great number of abandoned schoolhouses, particularly in the west coast, in the areas where formerly known as congested districts. <coughs> so are you familiar with the penal laws? Um, the laws uh, implemented against um, Catholics from about I think 1690, I think 1665 to about 1782, 1783, which uh, forbade um, uh, Catholics from receiving formal education. So prior to the um, to schoolhouses existing in the country, schoolhouses did exist in the 17th and 18th century, but the education was primarily primarily. Um, the privilege of descendancy, so generally the Protestant, Protestant descendancy in Ireland. Catholics generally weren't educated, they didn't um, learn to read and write, um, except in the case of hedge schools, and hedge schools were often established in a locality. Despite what the name says, hedge schools didn't really take place in, in hedges. Um, it's, it's not a very accurate name. They, they took place in any building that could facilitate educating um, uh, children. This is the, the primary way in which young Catholic children would learn to read and write before the establishment of schoolhouses in Ireland. We have plenty of documentary evidence um, describing different hedge schools around the country. Often they were taught by a local person who didn't know how to read and write or did, had some level of education. And it was the way of overcoming um, the penal laws basically and allowing um, uh, predominantly Catholic public to, to learn to read and write. Um, but as we advance into the into the late 18th and early 19th century, we kind of have late Georgian and early Victorian kind of social reforms. And a new ethos begins to spring up whereby um, it's kind of a it's a social reform. So you see a lot of kind of prison reform at the time. Um, there's a new kind of worldview where people are no longer um, seen completely <coughs> as just um, as workers, you know, it's a tendency to invest a little bit more in society and the public. Um, from that, we get the 1806 and 1812 Commission of Inquiry 
to the state of education in Ireland. So these are a series of reports that were released between 1806 and 1812, uh, and they were basically an inquiry into the state of education in Ireland. Um, it's from these reports that we get the critical date of 1831, which is the National Schools Act in Ireland. Um, this is really the, the starting point of the project and a lot of the schools that I um, have looked at, they were post-date 1831, because in 1831 with the National Schools Act, um, it basically put in place a system whereby schools could be built. Um, there were part, schools were partly funded by the government and partly funded locally, you should have 50-50. So 50% 50 of the money to build a school house would come from the locality, 50% would come from central government. Um, important elements of the National School Act. Number one, national schools were to be non-denominational, and this is still the backbone of our of our national school system today. Um, nearly 190 years later, our national schools are actually supposed to be non-denominational. Various me me machinations um, between then and now, and the tendency for people to send their children if they were Catholic, they'd send them to. The school was established by the Catholic Church, and if they're Protestant, they tend to tend to tend to send their children to schools established by the Protestant Church. That is what has kind of created the split in our school system today. Technically, they they are they are non-denominational. Um, so, the, but the, the 1831 Act funds were made available to build these school houses, and the OBW began to design the school houses. Um, I think I have an example. So the OPW start to send out these kind of plans. So we would raise money locally. Now there's different ways that you could raise money locally. You could try and do it within the community. But quite often you're talking about a local landlord or somebody wealthy within the community that would patronize the schools. So they would provide 50% of the, the funds that were needed and the rest would be supplied by government. You would apply to have your school built and what you would receive from the OPW are designs like this. Um, the first one there is uh, Durney National School in County Galway, that's actually the right one, and North Yard National School in County Roscommon. These centrally sourced um, plans supplied by the OBW are the reason why you can go to the north of Donegal and there's Mallon Head and see a schoolhouse that's identical to one that you'll see on Mizzen Head, because all the, plan the plans are actually coming from the OBW, they're not being designed locally, these are all centrally sourced um, plans. So where are we going at 1831? Excuse me? Yeah. What's LPW? Sorry, well, uh, Office of Public Works. Does that do ask any questions as well? Don't be afraid to interrupt. Because um, this is supposed to be an engaging project. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, Office of Public Works, they were the they were responsible for building public um, buildings within the country. So I think it's for building it when they were young. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, so with with the construction of the schoolhouse and the availability of education, this is a monumentous um, move forward in Ireland um, from the 1830s onward. Education is everything. Every, every education is most vital um, element of, of, of a nation, of a society. Education is crucial. A good education system. Without education, you have no way to progress whatsoever. So it's monumental. It's a huge shift. And from the 1830s onwards, there's a big movement for people to want, they, they really want to educate their children. They want them to do better. They want them to, to move on in life. So by 1900, we're going from a base of probably about 2,000 schools in, in about the 1830s. By 1900, there's 8,700 schoolhouses in operation in the country, with 746,000 pupils. This is from a base, especially for Catholics, a base of you know, close to nil, basically. Well, not quite, quite nil, but very, very low. So you can see that it's a huge social shift, it's a huge driving element in the country. And it's no coincidence that at this time, and there has been a drive for independence through the, well, basically since we weren't independent, but um, 
I don't think there's any coincidence that with the, with the drive of the education system, it's by the, by the beginning of the 20th century that we start to realistically begin to achieve um, independence. And it's all about education at the end of the day. Um, so 8,700 schools in uh, 1900, 1922 with independence, the free state inherits the school system. Um, so they have inherited the infrastructure, the school buildings, um, and everything that I've been photographing for the past three or four years or so. Um, the school system uh, changes a little bit with the free state, but it, what changes most is the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum. The curriculum changes quite rapidly. Um, in 1922, uh, with the establishment of the free state, the, the curriculum has been set um, previously under, under British control by the, by the 1930s, they're very heavily modifying the curriculum to basically to include the Irish language and to include Irish history. So um, uh, it's moved on, even though the infrastructure itself probably doesn't change an awful 